thank you guys for joining us. My name is Miranda Dew. I'm the current chair of the IGA Los Angeles chapter. Today we have our dating some panel. We're very excited for this event. Um, we really want to dive into this genre and get to know about the processes behind building some of these awesome narrative experiences. Um, we are hoping to do more uh, dating some events in the future, so stay tuned if you enjoy this one. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, hand it over to Z, who is our moderator for this event. And um, yeah, he's going to be hosting this panel for us today. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, I'm Z. I'm the founder, executive director at Serenity Forge. We are uh, a video game development company and publishing company located in Colorado. Um, I also happen to be the chair for IGDA Colorado. So it's, it's kind of cool that we're, you know, doing this IGDA kind of almost crossover thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, so so dating sims, you know, definitely a very big topic. Uh, and, and we have some really amazing panelists here today with us. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting, just from my personal pers perspective working in the dating sim genre, uh, is the fact that it is really, it's, it's, like a, it's like a genre that, that kind of like briefly existed and it was really niche at one point. But then, but then now it's like, it, it suddenly had this renaissance period during the past, you know, five years, 10 years or so. It, it kind of evolved into something else. And I think it's really interesting, I think, for the panelists today to really dive into a little bit further regarding kind of like, how did they get into the industry? How did they start working on the projects that currently are working on? And maybe eventually look at some of the paths of how this industry is going forward. So without further ado, uh, you know, uh, let's go ahead and just uh, get started with uh, perhaps uh, we can have our panelists uh, just do a quick round of introductions. Love to learn a little bit more about who you are, um, what projects you worked on, uh, and uh, you know what you did for it, and also just a little bit more about how you got into the industry and how you kind of got to where you are today. Um, perhaps we can just go in. I don't know what's the best way. Let's let's do alphabetical order. Perhaps I think that's probably a, a pretty straightforward way. Uh, Alexei, would you like to start? Sure. As soon as we hit alphabetical, I knew I was up either way. <laughs> I got an A and a B. So um, my name is Alexei. Uh, I work at a, a creative slash animation studio called Psyop, and generally I make TV commercials and video game trailers. Um, this past December. I did a trailer for Mass Effect that was in the Video Game Awards. So if people watch that, or if there's Mass Effect fans, there's a, let's say a blue skinned woman appears at the end, uh, whoever she might be. She looks like she's aged a while. So I directed that um, for EA and, and Bioware. Um, and I've done other sort of video game content like that. But I also love uh, making games and telling stories in a sort of longer form than 30 seconds or 90 seconds or whatever. Um, and so a while back, I started experimenting with branching narratives and, and created a, an all ages dating sim of my own, um, just as a kind of personal project with some friends uh, of mine at SIOP. And, and it was just a, a pleasure to work on. Um, and eventually, as, as Z mentioned, that kind of this boom in, in interest um, found me again um, via the KFC dating sim. So KFC has an ad agency. Um, who I work with on, on other projects, ad type projects. Um, and they reached out to us to find out if, if we were interested in working on a dating sim for KFC. So I just jumped at the, at the chance and then the rest is, is deep fried history. Um, but that's kind, of, that's kind of me a little bit. So I'll let you hand it off to the next. Awesome, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and then uh, I think next in the order here is uh, Kwatemo. Uh, would you be able to introduce yourself real fast? Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Guatemo de them. Um, I am working on Lovecraft, um, uh, dating some about monsters who hate their bodies. Um, I started off in film, actually, because I, uh, I, I also just have a deep love of storytelling. Um, and I did cinematography and script writing for my undergrad. And then I kind of did my own stuff on the side. Um, and then I ended up going to USC for grad school and ended up starting uh, to work on Lovecraft um, just to like cope with my own dysmorphia. Um, and it's been kind of like a part therapy, part game dev, part storytelling um, for, for myself and uh, I think, uh, yeah, for, for other folks as well. Um, now, I, interesting enough, I, I work on robotics. I'm working on a, a robot for children with ASD and ADHD. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, yeah, next, you. oh, go ahead, sorry. 
No, I was just oh, oh yeah. yeah. All right, awesome. Uh, I, I think we, uh, next we have uh, Kelsey. Would you like to go? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so hi, I'm Kelsey. I am a writer and a narrative designer. Currently, I'm working on the mobile app Choices Stories You Play, which has a library of interactive stories centered around romance and friendship. Um, on that app, I've worked on America's Most Eligible, Blaze of Light and Shadow, The Royal Masquerade, and most recently, Slow Burn, which is a culinary-themed romance, and it's coming out next month. And I'm really excited to share it with everybody. Uh, let's see, I've been in the industry for about three years now. Um, before then, I was doing a little bit of journalism, editing, and marketing um, for work. Uh, let's see. So basically, as soon as I learned that I didn't need like a CS degree to work in games, I was like, oh, let me go try and work in games. And uh, Pixelberry is where I landed. So yeah, excited to be here. Yeah, it's really awesome. I mean, especially with the just the low barrier of entry nowadays when it comes to game dev technology. I mean, Unity is already a really good example, but stuff like, uh, you know, uh, uh, just Game Maker, you know, in the past, or RPG Maker even. And of course, you see things like um, uh, RemPy and all that for, for especially dating sims and visual exactly. novels. Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of really good tools out there. And like, it's it's pretty straightforward to learn a lot of them. You just have to like, want to learn them, I guess. But yeah, it's been good. Awesome. Uh, and then lastly, uh, I believe we have uh, Tyler. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Tyler. Um, I was the director and lead developer of Dream Daddy, a dad dating simulator. Uh, my route to um, games, I think, was a little is a little weird. I mean, not super weird. I originally did research in uh, evolutionary computation and genetic algorithms. Uh, which is generally now, uh, now currently it's very popular for a lot of AI things. But back when I was doing this research, the only people who cared were like the Department of Defense. And I wasn't really interested in pursuing that as a career path. So I just started working as a software engineer, making like medical records database software. Uh, during this time, I made a lot of indie comics and made a lot of friends in web comics. And uh, it was kind of something that made me feel good about my job. Uh, I eventually left my job as a software engineer and moved to Los Angeles to work in animation development and comics. And through that experience, I kind of made friends with uh, people at a, a advertising company called Puny Animation and ended up becoming their uh, CTO or just uh, the CTO was a title of like, hey, you're the guy who makes iPhone apps for us. So I spent a lot of time just hammering out games and apps of like one every you know month or two of uh, it'd be like, oh, Nesquik wants a... Um, a bejeweled clone. Of course, they wouldn't dare tell you that they just want a bejeweled clone. They'd be like, we want a match game where like if you match three or four in a row, it'll like destroy them on the board. And then you have to, and it's like, oh, you want a bejeweled clone. So I spent a lot of time making uh, commercial advertisement kind of apps for iPhones and Facebook. Um, this kind of led me into joining a community here in Los Angeles called Glitch City which is just an amazing community of indie devs who came together because a lot of indie devs sort of have this solitary work experience where it's just them or like them and a few other people shut up in a room or in a coffee shop just like hammering away on things and uh, glitch city was an excuse to talk to other people who are making games <laughs> Uh, and it, it just kind of became this really great community. And from there, I eventually um, ended up uh, meeting Vernon and Layton, who are the creators and writers of Dream Daddy. And uh, they kind of told me uh, what was happening. They're like, well, we really want to make this into a video game. Is this something you'd be interested? In? And uh, that kind of set up the connection to working on Dream Daddy. Um, I'm currently working at a company called Heart Machine, making a game called Solar Ash, which is coming out sometime this year for PS5 and a bunch of, and PlayStation 4, I think. I don't know what's, yeah, so check it out. Also, hi, Brian Handy uh, is currently sitting in the audience and he was, uh, he helped create the mobile port of Dream Daddy and did a bunch of great stuff. So glad, glad to see you here. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for the intro. Uh, it's cool that you're at Heart Machine. Uh, say hi to Tina and Casper for me uh, next time uh, you, you guys have a chat. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, what, one of the things when it comes to working on video games, I think this is very relevant to all artists, right? Like, or, you know, like our artists with quotes on it. Um, so like basically, uh, you know, as a creator, we're always going to be inspired by something. And I remember as a child, one of the things that really, is, uh, that w I found fascinating was um, I, I used to play a lot of like strategy games like Nobunaga's Ambition and stuff. Uh, and I remember uh, the founders of Koei at the time saying that they were inspired by the fact that they were working on spreadsheet software. And then eventually it was so interesting that they decided to make like a Japanese feudal war system in that spreadsheet software. And then eventually it became a game company. Uh, and that was just really interesting. Um, I feel like when it comes to visual novels, uh, especially dating sims, you know, a lot of the original ideas that comes out of this is it's inherently very personal, right? Because it, it's very narrative driven. It's very kind of like a one to one communication between my idea, my direct narrative idea to the other person sitting in front of the screen. So I'd be I'd love to kind of hear a little bit more from the panelists regarding where did your idea start? Like, how did you have this in you and, and when you're starting this how do you kind of get it going um so i guess we can go ahead and you know start over from from the beginning alexei would you like to go uh yeah sure um you know for me it's it's maybe a little unique because i uh was commissioned to make this particular game um you know someone came to me and said we want a dating sim with colonel sanders and maybe it's school but he can't be a teacher because that's not the, the proper power dynamic for a, a feel good game. So, you know, that was kind of what I was working with. I happen to be a sort of lifelong serial animation fan. So, you know, anime is the big place where really big, long, intricate stories get told in animation. Um, you know, no, no uh, shade thrown at American cartoons, but, um, you know, Japanese cartoons tend to be based on long form personal comic books that therefore sort of turn them into these really long personal stories. There's a lot of like slice of life, a lot of how to get into various like careers and, and school clubs. And it's just a whole vibe in, in anime that I've loved since I was a, a, a teenager. And so, you know, the opportunity to kind of meld that interest in those kind of big worlds that tend to power a, a good animated cartoon um, and, you know, dating sims and, and the tropes therein, it was just a really fun opportunity. I, I think to speak to the, the intro a little bit, um, anything where you're going to sit down and write a script alone for the first part, you know, it's, it's so close to writing a novel or writing a short story um, to compose something like a dating sim where you're a kind of sole author of this narrative um, production. Um, so for me, it was tackling it like a, a kind of a TV show, thinking about my cast of characters and my sets um, that I would return to uh, and, and what my two big plots were gonna be, my sort of heroes A plot and, and my best friends B plot and what our villains will be up to and sort of approaching it like a pilot episode of a TV show. Um, and then just pouring all my love of, of pop culture archetypes and, and anime archetypes and even you know Saturday morning cartoons or Simpsons or whatever else in that pot of influences that we all have that's unique to us um, and really just sort of pouring that out um, and then sort of bringing in collaborators as as it as it went and and letting you know the folks who really owned this intellectual property um, get their say as well and and work as a team which is you know where it stops being a novel and starts being a video game you know um, it, it's a bigger production there's more generally speaking, um, even in, in an indie world where you, you aren't a total one person band um, who just does everything. Um, so, so then it was like, hey, let's collaborate. What's, what would be funny scenarios? What would be funny sort of, um, who are your favorite characters from other shows and what would it be like if one of them wandered in here? And what was really important to me was um, you making something that could be considered a gimmick or or could be considered you know sort of derogatory toward the actual source material um, isn't interesting to me you know I didn't want to sort of cash in on the craze with a little short like burst of something um, it was really important to me that folks who who took the time to get onto Steam and download this game um, discovered that it was actually a game and actually a story and there was actually uh, character growth and experience that happened over time so. Um, you know, I felt very privileged to have this like gimmick 
Colonel Sanders, he's sexy, it's anime. Like, ah, this is weird. Let's just look at it because it's, it could be a total train wreck. Um, but to then sort of collaborate with really excellent people on, on making it something big um, and real, um, that, that to me was really important to sort of do justice to all the other dating sims that I had played just out of personal interest. And then the more I played as research um, and to sort of live up to, to all the folks out there, especially in the indie world, especially on itch, especially in, in game jams who are just like pouring themselves into something. Um, and I wanted to make sure that even though I was doing it on behalf of a you know, international mega corporation, um, that it still felt like a product made by people who love the thing that they're talking about and, and presenting. Yeah, wow. It's, uh, I mean, it's really, really great to kind of hear the process that you shared. I, as far as I'm aware, Alexa, you have, you know, a, more than a decade of experience in the game industry. And, you, you know, you definitely have uh, your hands in, in a lot of projects in the past. And, and it's really, really cool to hear kind of your thought on the fact that dating sims, as, as like, a, like a good dating sim developer, you, you almost have to like, use a premise to trick someone into accidentally learning some educations or something like that and i just i just find that like that mindset so heartwarming and, and such a such a such a such a great way to to behave i suppose as a game dev that you know what we do as designers have consequences to the audience yeah I, now i would give just big up to to christine love and um love conquers all games with you know, a, a kind of trio of dating sims that I think were really a big influence on pushing that genre into this kind of Western indie ideal um, that to me, like those games were, were huge. And, and obviously like, um, you know, more traditional Japanese dating sims that really feel like sort of harem anime or, or things like that, or even Hatoful Boyfriend, which is, you know, a parody of all of those trends. Like those are cool um, and really interesting to me and dovetailed nicely with my just love of Japanese cartoons and comic books. But it was Lady Killer in a Bind that was a game for me that grabbed me on a premise that was sexy and, and funny um, and then was just a great story and great characters. And I, and, and I felt myself um, really thinking about that particular game as, um, you know, a magical game that does it all, right? That that is, honors the past, but 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 drives forward into a new direction, and, and that's always great. So um, for me, it's that's that's a primary influence. Yeah, totally. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, so, uh, Quatimo, could you could you share a little bit more about uh, how you kind of get started? I, sus I I suspect there's a ton of influence, especially from your background outside of actual making games. Uh, you know, really love to hear that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I uh, maybe like in a, in a different fashion, I was definitely influenced by like the uh, pop culture zeitgeist um, coming off of the hype of uh, The Shape of Water and um, Guillermo del Toro's work. Uh, I wanted to make something, um, I was like kind of questioning all of uh, my identity and stuff like that. And um, uh, there was there was something in there about uh, feeling monstrous and wondering if you are monstrous enough to be loved um, that I wanted to kind of pose to the audience. Um, and there's also that like weird non-binary uh, 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 paradigm of, of um, I love when non-binary characters are like robots and like gargoyles and elves and stuff. But at the same time, I'm like, hey, can you just treat me like a person? Um, so. I was really enamored by that. Um, and I also just wanted to kiss the giant fish man. Uh, so I started working on the project um, as part of my grad thesis. And as I started moving forward more and more with it, um, slowly the tagline became, uh, you are worthy. Um, and it became more about these people, these monsters who didn't think they were worthy of love, didn't think that they could be loved. Um, and I, I, as I started working more on it, uh, I found that a lot of my work revolved around that. Um, I worked on a, a small RPG called um, Rhapsody of Swing, uh, which is like a jazz um, combat game. Uh, and it was a lot about um, not feeling like you belong. Uh, and I wanted Lovecraft to be this kind of like going into madness that is realizing who you are um, and the eldr eldritchness of selfness. 
yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's Lovecraft. <laughs> Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so I much. I hope I answered your question. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of it just has to do with, you know, our per again, like I said, the kind of the personal connection to your work, right? Mm -hmm. And just, you know, hearing, I, I, I definitely believe that, you know, hearing a little bit more about kind of what inspires you and kind of how you get started. It's, it's very critical. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Kelsey, would you like to share a little bit more about uh, your work, especially on choices? I mean, like, obviously, there's a lot of choices uh, in, in, in everything. I mean, that must be an extremely complex endeavor. Yeah, so basically choices is unlike anything I've ever worked on before. Like, I'll, I'll be honest, like before I got into the industry, I didn't really write romance very much. I didn't really consume it, I think, actively. Um, but after I started like really diving deep into the genre, I'm like, there's a lot of really interesting stuff here to mine. And, you know, as someone who um, I think is like most mostly character focused um, in the way that I write, like that's usually where I start first, just like with good characters. Um, when you have a story like choices, like your your story is going to live or die based on how strong those characters are and whether people are enamored with those characters and want to know more about those characters. Um, so I think like the thing, let's see. Yeah, so for romance, I think part of it is I look at it from the audience's perspective. Um, so I don't approach writing as if it's a screenplay or, or anything like that. Like I am thinking about it with the audience in mind. Um, so for example, like I really enjoy slow burn romances, um, that's going to look very different in a game as opposed to how it would look in a movie or a TV show. Cause basically the player expectation is if a character is romanceable, that's going to be broadcast right out of the gate. Um, so basically like there's always going to be a flirt option or like an option, like let's get to know this character. It's basically, um, I guess like cutting through the barrier that would be there in any other medium. Um, so that was just like an interesting thing to learn, I think, when I was starting to work on choices. Just like the storytelling and the way that you introduce characters, all of that is going to look a little bit different. And that is because of player expectation. So I hope that answered your question. But. Yeah, totally. That's really, really valuable. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Tyler, would you be able to share? I mean, it sounds like you had more of a kind of a collaborative effort to start, especially. So I'd love to kind of hear how that went. Yeah, so I mean, like the the classic story that uh, gets told is um, essentially Vernon and Layton are are right are the creators and and our writers, who are lovely people, went to Disneyland and noticed uh, that there were just a ton of hot dads all over Disney, and um, this, you know set off alarm bells in either Leighton or Vernon's head of just like, why is there not a hot dad dating simulator? Um, I think by the time I was brought onto the project, uh, it's there, there was a very clear idea of who these dads were and these characters. And I think Leighton especially just had this very great vision of who of, of who these hot dads were and is was able to maybe just tap into the zeitgeist of what gets uh, people on Tumblr all horned up um, from like, what are they going to be most like, I, I, w what is the current thing that makes someone hot? Um, so I, I think the, the fun part of that collaboration was then coming into Game Grumps which has, you know, is a YouTube channel that's that's kind of built on this very frenetic, improvised comedy, and um, kind of trying to build a game to match that sense that sense of humor and and feeling. And I think with a lot of Dream Daddy in the early phases, it was just like throwing everything at a wall and seeing what would stick or what would make each make people in the room laugh um you know what if what sounds silly and fun and and just kind of it feels sticky um and i think if you can do that and make someone be like yes we absolutely you know we absolutely need to have a, a uh a fishing uh, mini game where you are trying to match fish that all look exactly the same because they're just like fish and that's something dads would be good at. They can identify the differences of fish or uh, just silly stuff like that. Uh, it's it's a great way to, to try and um, 
harness that energy and then boil it down, which is an interesting experience because games generally aren't something you can do quickly or in an, improvis in an improvised fashion. So how do you take that energy and then try to create something that still matches it in a process and a medium that takes lots and lots of work and trial and error? Um, and I think that is something that, you know, it's kind of where we, we started off and we, we knew we had this really great sincere and sweet story to tell but we wanted to make sure that it was funny and silly and 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 a joy to play at the end of the day um yeah yeah i mean i definitely personally feel like dream daddy is one of those games where i mean it was very similar to colonel sanders where you know it tricks the player into something but then it's essentially like once you once you open that door you realize that you just you know there's so much care and delicate uh, you know, attention to detail, everything that was put you know, into this game. Yeah, I, I think, you know, from a fairly early on point, maybe, maybe like midway through the project, we kind of started to, things started to come together. We started to see finished character art from Shannon Pei, who's our amazing, brilliant artist on the game. Um, and And we started to, I think, realize that we really had a great opportunity here to reach a fairly broad audience that maybe had not explored or thought about a lot of these topics that we cover in Dream Daddy um, that are kind of cool to, to be like, hey, ch check this out. You actually might secretly learn something, uh, but also check out all these cool flashing lights. Um, and, you know, there's some good bits in here for you to, to enjoy. So, Awesome. Um, so, so this question is uh, kind of interesting. Uh, when I was first reached out to uh, by IGA uh, Los Angeles uh, uh, regarding the panel, one of the first things that I noticed about the panel and like the people, essentially, is, uh, especially the, the panelists who are here uh, that were invited, um, you know, the, yes, of course, we work in visual novels, we work in dating sims. However, let's be real, right? Like if you open up Steam and then you do a search of dating sims, if you just statistically pull out a random dating sim from Steam, it's probably not going to look like the games that our panelists here today have made. Um, I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts regarding a, being a creator that is essentially working in, in under a genre, under a title, right? Like that's, that's kind of the thing that you have to be defined by due to the technical limitations of what you do. Yet it is actually very significantly different than than what you do. I'm, I, you know, really, you know, feel free to jump in here. I just love to hear a little bit about um, your personal thoughts on how how is that? Is that okay? Um, or or like, do we need to change something about that? Like, what what can we do to to make this a little better? Is the question the degree to which we've sort of appropriated a genre of smut of like actual? hand-drawn smut and we're all kind of turning it into something that we find a little more uh appealing is that is that is that kind of where perhaps where but at the same time uh you know, the, the 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 fact that you mentioned this smut i'm actually i'm i'm curious to dig a little bit more into that too i'd be love i'd love to hear like what is your opinion of that like is that good for society anyway i mean there that's a hand grenade i'll jump on it because i i love putting my foot in my mouth. Um, you know, Japanese cartoons and Japanese comic books, um, they go smutty and in a way that, I, I mean, as a, as a young man, uh, let's say caught my attention um, for sure. It was like, there's ninjas and they're slicing heads off and then there's a ton of bare breasts and like neither of those things are in the cartoons I was consuming on Saturday morning. Um, and what I realized was, you know, that that cultural barrier, that language barrier, just the approach to sort of media, um, it was just so different. And, you know, it wasn't my native, you know, it's certainly not my native language, but not my native approach to telling stories, right? And and there are Japanese cartoons that I, I just find unwatchable because of the just the porn element of it, right? Where there's a show that I find really good and then all of a sudden it's just like, takes this weird hard left turn into something grotesque. Um, and so I think that the, that's some of that, that it's just a cultural divide. It's just the way that we tell stories and the way that we think about gender and sexuality. 
um, as the sort of different cultures. Um, you know, dating sims being a primarily kind of anime or, or Japanese media influenced genre, I think they bring a lot of that baggage with them. Um, and folks who tend to be into that, into those games are already part of a subculture that indie games are their own subculture and you've got all these sort of subcultures and, and when you like something weird, you learn to kind of uh, put up with some of those weird weirdsies that come from other people who are into the, the, that subculture stuff. You just, you just have to, um, or else you, you find yourself totally isolated. And I think that that's a big part of, of the, the genre is facing down some stuff that makes you a little uncomfortable sometimes, um, but adopting the courage to tell those weird unconventional stories and, and using it for something that maybe you, you're, you're proud of um, in the end. So I, I, can, I can sort of feel, you know, cause I, I'm on Steam, right? I, um, it's like Honey Pop and, and cat girl games and like other excuses for, for cartoon boobs to appear are usually the suggested titles, which is cool, you know, like that's fine. Um, but it's just not necessarily what I see my day-to-day -day, uh, uh, career in making those exact type of games. I don't know how yeah. anybody else feels about all the sex inherent in, in sort of the, the, yeah. um, the genre. Yeah, often. Uh, yeah, I definitely like, up until I was an adult, probably the oh, my only real interaction with dating sims was just like seeing anime women with like, you know, breasts like bigger than their head and um, especially like as a young kid being kind of just generally confused by it. Um, and I think I, I was interested in dating sims to begin with because of how, uh, I don't know, I, I thought it was a nice opportunity to subvert it. Um, Cause I don't think that there's anything wrong with, with uh, porn or, or smut or anything like that. Um, I definitely was like, you know, a high school kid on fanfiction.net, like writing my own and stuff. Um, but I, I don't know, I feel like there's a more ethical way to do it than I, than I think that some games uh, try to approach it as. There's just like a point where, um, uh, does it feel like a, a healthy influence um, when they kind of become like a faceless set of tits? Yeah, totally. I mean, this in in this line of work, everything you do, you're kind of walking on a knife's edge, right? Because because it really depends on. I mean, first of all, art. You know, one could argue that it kind of depends on the beholder. So the message that you are sending to 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 the players might not necessarily be the same message that you know. Like, well, by the time they receive it, might not be the same message that you're sending. And a lot of that can be pretty difficult to handle. I think a really good example is um, a game that came out uh, a, a while back called uh, Katawa Shoujo. I'm, I'm sure anyone who works in this field, you know, have at least heard about this game. Uh, and this is a very, it's a serious topic um, that I think as, as almost as an industry, like we, we never like fully addressed, I suppose, uh, at least from my perspective. Um, but yeah, I mean, like everything that we do might not be at that level, uh, you know, of, of like the knife's edge that, you know, whatever was going on there. Um, but, but, you know, certainly every kind of game, at least for the developers here on this panel, we're trying to make a statement, we're trying to do some good, we're trying to, we're trying to push it in the right direction, you know, uh, as opposed to the waves that's co coming from the other side. Um, I'll just jump in here. Um, so one of the things with choices is like we are geared toward a younger audience, I think, than a lot of dating sims are. Like our sex scenes are never explicit. Like there's always like a tasteful fade to black. There's no nudity in the game. Um, so like one of the things that we're like very focused on, I think, like especially when it comes to sex is talking about consent and what like a healthy relationship should look like because we are mindful that we do have younger players who are looking at our stuff. So, um, so basically it is a free to play game, meaning that there is some monetization. Um, so basically for the sex scenes, we call them hookup scenes, um, that would like take an in-game currency to unlock. So basically it's like, you're already consenting by buying the scene, but within the scene, there's always a choice to say like, yes, let's continue. Or like, actually let's just like cuddle and have a chat. So basically it's saying like, we're, tr we're trying to teach our players too. I think that like if you give consent once, that's great, but that doesn't mean that's going to carry through the entire time. 
So that's something that we try to be very cognizant of. And I think probably a lot of dating sims don't lean on that because it's like everyone's here for the sex and they just kind of assume. Um, but our games are a lot more friendship and, and romance focused as well. And so we just try to be careful. Yeah, wow. working working on behalf of a uh, a corporate sponsor, uh, there's there's no sex in the KFC dating sim, yeah. which much to the consternation of many <laughs> many many Steam reviewers and normal folks <laughs> as well. Um, but that's where I that's where I see it, um, and you know that's it's interesting because it's it's not even a dating sim; it's a visual novel, you know, which is one of those like we, hair splitting genre definitions. You don't really get to choose who you romance in in the KFC dating sim. Dating sim is just kind of shorthand for romantic story, um, and so it's really more a visual novel with with branching pathways that take you toward a a, a, a hug at the end, basically. Um, but what I found interesting working on a game prior was I made a friending sim where, you know, all the participants, all the characters in the game are children um, and it's an all ages experience. And, and the idea of that is taking these mechanics of this like harem, this, this uh, you know, menu of su potential suitors and thinking about it as being just a stranger trying to connect with someone. Um, and in the case of that game, it's your, you've snuck into a summer camp and there's clicks essentially, and you talk to folks and get a feel for what type of activities speak to you and what type of kid is associated with those activities. But um, I think it's been, it's been, it was interesting to dig into the much more sort of specific dating sims where, you know, there's this specific payoff of a, of a romantic scene at the end, and then dig into visual novels that kind of butt up against dating sims, but are doing something else and trying to tell a different story. And I think that that's really exciting because the barrier to entry to make one of these games is pretty low in terms of the technology you need or, or the background you need, and you just really need the desire to spend the time um, writing it. That's the primary time sink is just the writing. Um, so I think it's a place where people are really playing with what those expectations are. And, and that's what makes it such a fun genre. Um, and it's a good place to find the, that romance and, and be treated to stories from written by people who are really interested in exploring ideas, complicated ideas, like even if it seems like a mass market thing like consent. Um, and, uh, and I find it a genre that's really worth exploring for all those reasons. Uh, I, I love hearing the stories, uh, particularly in choices about the, the pushing consent um, or, or encouraging consent in player behavior. It's something that we, I think in, in early on in Dream Daddy did not, we ran into in a version of, I think in our original version of Dream Daddy, by the time you get on to your last date with Joseph, it eventually leads into a tasteful fade to black hookup scene. Uh, but I think a lot of players by that point discover some information about Joseph that made them change their choices. And we actually got a lot of pushback on that. And in subsequent re-releases, we patched it to give people a choice. But it was such, um, I think as developers and as a team, we were already like, if you've made it this far by with Joseph, like you're here for, you're here to like, you're ready for some of that, you know, good Christian youth minister energy. Um, but it, it was a shock to, to not think, to just be like, oh yeah, how did we not think about this? That obviously you might really have some change. Your feelings might really change about Joseph by the time you get to the end and learn everything about him. Um, so it, I, I really appreciate hearing uh, about that stuff. It's like, oh yeah, we definitely ran into some of that. And I, I, I think I personally had never played any dating sims before making Dream Daddy. Um, and I think we 100%, or at least I totally just approached this as a, of, of like, okay, what are some of the tropes and how can we flavor this as a dating sim? But like, let's not feel like we have to hammer this story into being a dating sim. And, and I think ultimately, you know, Dream Daddy is really more of a visual novel with like some kind of um, dating, I don't know. It's a visual novel with, with mini games attached and some uh, fun point systems that 
may or may not make a, a ginormous amount of difference as opposed to just like your actual choices. Uh, but like, it, it was kind of nice to, to try and just not worry about that and try to just tell a, a nice wholesome story. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like one of the things that I feel like we're, we're constantly dancing around um, regarding, you know, being a creator for uh, something so intimate is, is really, um, it's especially for, for games where you play as an ensemble or play with a cast of characters, um, is to kind of the topic of diversity, inclusion, and just representation overall. Um, and this is especially important uh, in a mobile field um, where, you know, mobile devices are way more, you know, uh, used uh, by, you know, diversely, I suppose, around the world, as opposed to, you know, a Nintendo Switch or, or even, you know, Steam users. So I would love to hear a little bit about um, kind of each of the panelists, like how, how do you specifically, um, you know, think uh, when you're catering to your audience, how do you, what kind of actions do you actually take to make sure that you're having the proper rep representation. And especially Kelsey, I would love to kind of hear about kind of your experience with mobile uh, you know, users where you know, that, that is an entirely like a, a very different uh, kind, of a, kind of a demographic compared to you know, more of a PC and console realm. Yeah, so basically because Choices is a live service game, we're constantly getting feedback from the fans. Um, so like if, users don't like something we're going to hear about it pretty quick um i think too like in terms of diversity like choices and pixelberry as a whole has gone to great lengths to make sure that there's a diverse group of people making these games um so for each for each of the stories like there's always like a pretty sizable writing team and beyond that there are producers etc that people are constantly looking at this and constantly making decisions and making sure that we're being as I guess, mindful of our players as possible. Um, so like one thing comes to like localization, for example, like we know that there are a lot of players that don't have English as a first language. So we try to be careful about like the terminology we use. We're trying to make sure that our sentence structure can be like understandable for a broader audience, that kind of thing. Um, that's just something that we think about. And that's something that you see just like even in the writing style guide, um, even. Uh, what was the other part of the question? Sorry, I just went on a tangent. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that's, that's really great. I mean, it's, uh -huh. it's, it's really just, you know, how do you cater to your very vast and very diverse audience, um, you mm -hmm. know, when you're doing something so personal? Yeah, and two, another thing is like, we can, we can see in terms of like monetization, what people are responding well to. Um, so basically it's like, if people want like more customization for their character, if they want to be able to choose their pronouns, for example, like that's a thing that we've been seeing a lot of fans asking for lately. Um, I am a freelancer on choices, just to be clear, so I don't know what exactly like the execs are planning on doing with that, but I know that there's quite a lot of people working on choices who want to start going in that direction and, and catering more toward like a wider variety of folks. So. Yeah, I mean, anyone. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think, um, you know, coming from where I am, uh, to me, the most obvious important thing that I could do was hire hire diverse people to tell their stories and work on on this project and help diverse people make stories and and make it as e just get out of the way, right? Like um, I I'm great at being able to to look at a narrative and and you know say like, hey, here's a really good part that feels nice or like maybe expand on this uh but for the most part just try to get out of the way um for dream daddy i wrote a compiler that would basically build the game based on the scripts that vernon and leighton were, were writing um so that it was like trying to give our writers as much control of, of what happens as possible um, so that they didn't have to spend time learning the tools to like build build a game, um, and that was you know pretty cool. It, it it also allowed us to iterate on our stories a lot faster and just quickly crank out new iterations of the game. Um, I think learning as many different styles of story structure 
as well is is great broaden your horizons on the types of and ways that stories are told reading something like save the cat is is great but also be aware that this is a way to tell a story there's many other ways there's you know um check out the the onion method which is an amazing uh great storytelling of but or, or like you know joseph campbell's the hero cycle not everything's going to be that but it's it look into those things and figure out ways that that you can know all these different types of story telling structures so that when you do find stories you you can perhaps find one that matches with the story someone wants to tell um i think also just keep an ear to the ground and and try to to, to actively look for ways to be inclusive um with dream daddy we sometimes it felt like we were completely oblivious to things and then sometimes uh there were things that were so easy to do and implement it made me wonder why no one had ever added them before so a, a really big option in dream daddy that had a huge effect that took like four hours worth of work was in our character creator we added uh, a binder which was literally just a piece of piece of clothing to bind your chest so that if you wanted to, you could play as a dad who was wearing a binder. Um, and that opened up just a whole world of character creation that at the end of the day really was maybe four hours of work of being like, cool, we need a couple assets for adding this piece of clothing that a lot of people find really important in their day-to-day -day life. And we're able to see that as, as representation in the character creator that uh, like, I was like, yeah, that'd be really cool. And then, you know, I think when the game came out, I, I we was looking at Twitter and just all this flood of people were like, thank you for adding this. This like is one of the first times I've ever seen some form of representation of this in a character creator. And this, this meant so much to me. And I was like, oh, Okay, cool. I, uh, you know, it, it was a very sobering experience to, to realize that something that I think was relatively little work had a huge impact that I, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I'll ever have that experience of get, again of being able to do something that has so, the, the return on investment of like pay, emotional payoff for, for an effect was so big. And it's like, I, I don't know if I'll ever do something that that useful again. I hope so, but probably not. Um, so. Yeah, um, I actually wanted to make a dating sim because I'd specifically never seen like non-binary characters in dating sims. I also didn't tend to see like a lot of like love interests of color. Um, so I wanted to specifically address like that element. Um, I picked up the Arcana uh, on mobile um, sometime around like late 2018, 2018. Um, and I got to be a they, them person. And I also got to pursue someone who was also they, them. Um, and that was like a huge revelation for me of like, holy shit, I can like, I don't have to, I don't have to be like, do I want to be she or her? Or do I want to be he, him? Um, and I wanted to mirror that in Lovecraft. Um, half of our cast is non-binary, uh, but also like, um, because only one of our characters is actually human. Um, the way we talk about uh, race and culture is kind of different. Um, the I did want to like bring elements that people experience in their life around race and culture into the game without actually directly talking about it. Um, I myself kind of get frustrated when games are like, "Look, there's racism here too." It's like, no, 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 that's not <laughs> that's not what I'm here for. Um, so. Like Jonesy, for instance, um, is a, a huge shark man with super shark teeth, sharp teeth, um, and he can be really intimidating. He's something like eight feet tall, uh, and people often get nervous around him. Um, and ultimately, I wanted to tell a story that a friend had shared with me um, being a black man and being sick something and, you know, just muscle bound and huge and the kind of uh, welcome or lack thereof that he gets from people on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to tell stories like that. Awesome. Um, like say, would you like to add anything or? <laughs> Good. Yeah, I mean, I think 
you know, and this is like I'm I'm hitting broken record territory, but I, I think loving content that's not necessarily made for you, um, made with you in mind, but finding a reason to love it. Um it's a good it's good to remind yourself of the of those circumstances and and that so many other people are going through the same thing of feeling like um there's something about this thing and I love it and I realize it doesn't actually recognize who I am wouldn't it be neat if it if it did um and then getting to just kind of make that stuff um for yourself and for those other people um and so I I think sort of finding the to me it's it's the the sort of diversity of storytelling that comes with just international content, um, you know, games, especially, you know, we think of like Nintendo games, et cetera, um, you know, made by someone on the opposite side of the planet who maybe has similar way of life as you, but maybe doesn't. Um, and just thinking about more and more points on the planet and what that content that's coming from those places and, and how content will be received in those places and just making making games and telling stories for them um, while telling them for yourself. It's, it's just an interesting frame of mind to get into um, when you want to create something, because I, I do think there's a ton of power in telling a really personal story, um, but just keeping in mind who you're telling it to, you know, um, your friends who are like you, your friends who are different than you, maybe both of them. Um, it's just a, a way to approach storytelling that, you know, even if you are, um, you know, in my case, just like, um, you know, the, the whitest white guy from upstate New York, um, but loving like, you know, Japanese cartoons or Korean cartoons or, or whatever. Um, and then having some random brand pluck you and say, hey, help us like use our, our Southern, our, our elderly Southern mascot um, to tell a story. Um, you know, for me, it was, it was, well, I want to present this in that, in a way that's kind of true to the, the, that kind of anime cultural source material in which anime tends to take place in this kind of magical post-racial world where people have blue and green hair and it, it's hard to kind of identify folks. Um, and that's a kind of a, a luxury, um, quite honestly, to tell stories in that space where you don't have to deal with, with stuff like that. Um, but still, you know, that it's a, it's a, a, a game written without, without pronouns for your, for your lead character. And there's just a, such a simple thing to do. Um, from a marketing standpoint, it's like, you don't have to be a man or a woman or um, any particular gender assignment to love Colonel Sanders and like the challenge of cooking and falling in love, right? So why write the game from some very particular point of view that's going to lock some other people out if you don't need to? Um, so there's that like craven money-making angle and like bigger audience, more people who can envision being your character, you know, more money for you. Who doesn't want that, right? Great, more money. But there's this lovely side effect of, of like, also more people who have an experience that feels like maybe it was crafted for them. Um, and, and that's like the greatest reward, right? Is having someone say like, wow, this reflects my life in some weird way. Um, and I, I think that uh, I live in Los Angeles and, and uh, the, the billboards of Los Angeles constantly go between movie to movie or streaming network to streaming network. And for the past year, it has just been like either Apple TV or HBO Max or Disney Plus or something like that. And when you see one of those billboards, it's just a collection of popular characters. Like it's not about telling a new story. It's about collecting characters that represent the shared experience that we have that's that in the cases of the streaming platforms is going to encourage you to give them twelve dollars right to relive those memories you have of the fresh prince uh, uh seinfeld rick and morty whatever it is they're all on this poster together weirdly um but but what they're doing is they're they're trying to like um retcon reality into being this diverse space um, because it's profitable for them to do that. Um, and I, it's important to, to appreciate when sometimes that works out in everyone's benefit um, because more diverse offerings is really great. Um, but but do, it, do it for the audience, you know, like do, do it because you want more people to experience your, your storytelling. Um, I think it's just a great, it's a great uh, reason. Yeah, awesome. Uh, um, 
I have one yeah. more thing I would love to add to that. Yeah, go I, ahead. I, I realized I did say hire diverse people uh, and help diverse people make gains. And I think there's often, especially in tech, uh, this counter of like, well, but the only people we can find are all white guys. Um, to which I will just say, if you're an indie dev, if you're a developer, find a, a community uh, that is actively courting and trying to, to create an inclusive community. Uh, I, I feel so lucky to be a part of Glitch City, which is, is an indie game space that actively tries to like bring diversity to that space. Um, and if it were not for that, I think I, it, it would have, I would have really struggled to, to like find and meet new people who are working in games and, and uh, bring that to the table because like it's it's just yeah so I, I challenge you to to find communities that are actively actively working to be inclusive um to add you, on to that can. i would say also if you're trying to hire diverse people make sure that your requirements aren't insane like basically don't require like five years of AAA experience because the vast majority of people who are going to be able to get that are they're going to be white guys you know so I, th I think like look outside of what you assume is like the best experience to have for this particular job. Um, yeah, that's all. Yeah, I will also <laughs> add on to that. <laughs> um, let's all just PSS it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that uh, searching out like a diverse team is important, but I also think creating an environment for your diverse team to flourish is also really important. Um, you definitely don't want to create a space where this person feels tokenized. Or, yeah, I don't know, I've just been in so many um, boardroom meetings where someone's like, uh, do we say slave or enslaved? And then everyone turns to me and it's like, okay, <laughs> um, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, also don't make it so, don't make the barrier of entry so high. And also um, do your best to judge everyone at the same standards. Um, I mean, that those five years of experience, um, the, the, you know, my white male friend, uh, those five years of experience somehow are equivalent to him for grad school, um, but they're not counted for me for grad school. Uh, it's, it's, it's a weird space. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's actually a great tangent to one of the questions uh, that uh, was submitted from the audience. Uh, David asked a question, oh, keep scrolling. Uh, for someone who has never written uh, a dating, uh, for dating sims before, what are the softwares or written formats that you would recommend to add to your own portfolio uh, to, in order for you to land a job? Um, you know, like we talked a little bit about, you know, how to hire for diversity, but, you know, there are people who are also looking for jobs uh, too. So maybe some advice there uh, could be really helpful. I think your writing samples are what's most important, not necessarily the format. Like, I think if you learn things like Twine or RenP or even Ink, I think that's like a good start. But I think just like demonstrating that you understand like how visual novels work, how romance works, like that's important. Like I got my job using um, a spec script and like that's pretty far from like the type of writing that we actually do for choices. Um, so I would just say like focus on the quality of your writing and like whether you're nailing character, whether you're being true to the genre and whether like you're really capturing the audience's attention um, because like everything else can be learned. Like I learned how to code and how to use scripting languages, all that stuff after I got hired. Um, it won't hurt to learn that stuff for sure, but I would say just focus on the writing first. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, like I think same. Um, Tailor your port tailor a portfolio to the company that you're trying to get a job at. If you are applying for a job on a comedic game, submit your um, you know s submit your uh, oh what's a current TV show that's funny? Submit your AP bio spec script and um, a couple of like three three to four page scenes that are like sketches or I you know figure out what is gonna make you shine and stand out to say like, hey, I get the tone of this and here's some, some writing that'll match. Um, I think Twine's absolutely great. Uh, if you can bring a, something that shows a lot of juicy, meaty choices and, and show that you could build something that branches, uh, to me as a, a director, I'm gonna be like, great, you understand like what how to make things actually matter as a choice. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if you come to the table and you already know ink and inky, like I'm, I'm gonna be like, yeah, <laughs> I love it. That's I, I think currently one of the nicest branching narrative tools out there. Um, and it's so good for just making really in-depth and impressive stuff. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. And don't be intimidated by it. Like I learned it in a weekend. Like it's a very robust tool, but it's very intuitive. Like once you once you get started. So I would say prioritize learning ink because like yeah, there's yeah. so many there's so many uses for it. It's it's very good. Cool, awesome. Uh, so Maria asked the question: How do you find the balance between letting player decisions affect the story and not giving yourself too many branches of potential scenes and endings? I feel like this is a pretty common thing for all game designers to think about, but definitely especially relevant for uh, you know a dating sim. Uh, generally, uh, in like storytelling strategy, I it's like who cares? Make it good, you know the story that you're going to tell is going to be different than someone else's story. If you are feeling nervous about telling a story for the first time, um, steal a structure, you know, start there, just play your favorite game and make a lot of notes and see how many choices it gave you and, and what choices really worked for you and then steal that stuff and put it in your own game. Obviously you're going to make this your own. And as you continue to build on your stolen structure, you're going to say, actually, I want to do this differently. And, and you can do whatever you want. I think indie gaming in general, um, that's, that's why it's great. And, and that's why everyone should, should just do um, something that they feel really expresses them because that's kind of the point. Um, but, you know, honestly, there's, there are some great resources out there that will break down, you know, story structures and, um, and you can certainly read those and, and learn them. Um, but ultimately, you're, you're making a thing for another person to consume. So the best way to test that out is to give it to a person and let them consume it and hear what they think about it. Um, I, I think there's also some players love making choices and not every choice needs to be like do we cut off his arm or do we let him turn into a zombie or, or whatever right like yeah, some most of my of, most of them are flavor choices That's yeah the some, <laughs> some of my favorite choices are purely cosmetic to the story and and are something along the lines of like well what are you going to name uh your band and um every time you get to hear the band's name, you're like, yeah, I picked that stupid name. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and some, to me, that's sometimes more rewarding. Uh, even, I, I think even just the choice of naming a character can become extremely rewarding. Like if you play through Pokemon and you name your trainer just like Butthead or something, and every time Professor- Yeah, it becomes, like, becomes the height of comedy. Yeah, <laughs> pretty yeah. Easily. Uh, I think giving player choices that they get to feel like they're somehow getting away with something uh, is always enjoyable. So they may not always fully veer over to the end structure of your game, but I think they still feel very satisfying. Yeah, um, so definitely like uh, hard agree. Um, it's a lot about like the illusion of choice um, and it's a balance of like making that choice feel like it actually meant something without telling the player directly, like, that was nothing. I, I tricked you, ha. Huh? Um, I, I don't know, I remember like um, Life is Strange does that a lot of like, um, do you want pancakes or eggs and bacon? And it's like, this choice will have consequences. It's like, what kind of consequences? Um, definitely not trying to do that to the player while also making them feel like it mattered. And, and big games, you know, fall on their face all the time with this stuff. So, uh, you know, like, swing big and then you're going to see the waterfall of work you're creating for yourself with a branch and you might reconsider how do you get that branch back into the mainstream of your story because you can't keep his arm chopped off for the entire rest of the game um and you know you'll you'll read a cyberpunk review and it'll be like the choice didn't matter it was just one story and it's like wow here's you know a infamously robust development timeline and still they get to what is essentially one custom tailored story that they want to tell and they just make it feel like yours through a lot of that flavor um, because it is it's a lot of work to to branch out sometimes um, 
into into left field. But when when games pull it off, it's it's really remarkable. So try, you know, try it the best you can and um, and see where it gets you. Yeah. Awesome. I would say, um, sorry, really quick. I would say like you definitely need to know your ending and write toward your ending because that will determine how many branches you actually need. Um, so that I think that will save you a lot of heartache in the long run. Um, also in terms of making, like making sure that choices seem like they're going to count is like you make a difficult choice. So it's like, for example, you could decide like if you're face to face with a villain, you could tell them off and it's like you get the satisfaction of telling them off, but maybe your companion won't like that. Or you could be nice and your companion likes that, but then your the villain character thinks that like you're a pushover. So there should be like an interesting like push and pull between the different choices that you offer. And that makes the player feel like that choice matters a lot more because they had to think about it for more than like two seconds. So that's that's my quick answer for that. Awesome. Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of questions in the audience. Uh, so I think maybe we should, you know, uh, uh, just just maybe have some rapid fire ones that probably would you know help out uh, with answering some quick ones. Um, Tiffany asked a, uh, a question: How is monetization different in mobile versus Steam with a free game? I think this is especially relevant from a designer standpoint regarding like how do you design a game again to kind of kind of fit that audience, fit that monetization model. How much do you think about it when you're working on your games? All the time. <laughs> Like basically all the monetization is baked into the outlines that we that we work off of. Um, a lot of it is character customization. So like outfits, things like that. Um, and basically we find a way to like match the outfits to like the scenario in the story. Like you're going to a gala, do you wanna dress up or do you wanna wear like your little black dress? You know, something like that. Um, and then I guess like in terms of like, do you wanna date this character like extra hard <laughs> versus like the free path of dating? You know what I mean? Um, but basically, like that's something that we think about from the get-go for choices. So, yeah, that sounds really, really, really important. Um, certainly, um, Bjorn had a question. Uh, what would you uh, each say would be the number one takeaway, the one thing that a player can take away um, after playing your game? I mean, for for mine, it's like. I can't believe they did this. That's that's what that's the reaction that I was gunning for was simply I can't believe they did this. And I, I get to work from a very unique space of having a free making a free game and having you know a decent budget to make it with because I was making it on behalf of a, a billion dollar mega corporation. But in in the case of of the game, you know the idea was to generate a, a buzz, right? To generate a conversation. And to me, the easiest way towards that was the, um, you know, like the, the word actually, like they actually did this. That was a big driver of, of like, what could I do that someone will look at it and say like, wow, they actually did this. Um, and then just to um, make sure that they took away that it was an authentic experience, right? And that's part of that actually, like it's actually authentic, right? It, it actually loves these characters and this art form. Um, the art is actually good and the music actually slaps like this is a fun game. I'm glad I wasted my stream audience and my friends on my discord and my own time playing it um, because ultimately it's an advertisement in, in my case. Um, so I, I, I just wanted people to walk away thinking like the people that made this didn't just do it for the money like the people that did this ac actually care about it. Uh, I think for me with Dream Daddy, the hope is that if you are a straight person, you walked away from it saying something along the lines of, I've gained some more empathy about uh, what it's like to, to like, identify, I don't know, I've gained more empathy in the world in understanding that, that people in non-heteronormative uh, relationships can have deep and fulfilling and nice relationships and romances. And I think if you are are uh, gay or bi or pansexual, uh, you got to play Dream Daddy and say, wow, it was extremely nice to play this game where everyone is sexually open and um, I got to kind of exist in this fantasy world where people just got to date each other and not go through all the hassle of like real world 
problems that exist. <laughs> um, and this was a really refreshing, nice, fun experience of being in like a romantic comedy. Um, yeah. Uh, I think I'd want some kind of beautiful blend of like existential crisis of like, what does it mean to be human? Um, and triggering some kind of self uh, discovery journey. I think I just want good vibes. <laughs> like I, I, I think like choices tries really hard to be like very positive and I guess like pro-social uh, with everything that we do. So I, I think there are a lot of players who use our game as escapism. Um, you know, because they're trying to they're trying to find some joy. I think, especially in the past year, we've seen that from a lot of players. Like, thank you for making this. This is like the one thing that's made me smile, like in the past week. And it's that I think that is worth so much. Um, I think, like, if you made someone feel something, like you've done your job. So, awesome. Thank you. Uh, so we probably have only a, a time for about two to three questions, uh, uh, just so that people are aware. Um, but yeah, so so from that point, um, Rachel asked a really great question. What could AAA studios take away from dating sims in building relationships? Because um, if you're looking at especially games like Dragon Age versus Skyrim, you know, it's, it's very, very different. And, you know, we talked a lot about dating sims as a genre, but we didn't really talk so much about how this, the, like the things that, the things that we work with transpire into the greater you know the triple a industry i'd love to kind of hear your thoughts regarding like what can triple a do better from your own experience well they have to take it seriously from you know <laughs> for point one they need to take it seriously i think um and i think they need to realize like it's not easy to do you need to know what you're doing you need to understand how the audience thinks and how you want to present these characters um like what makes a fulfilling relationship and how would you demonstrate that in a game um, like I think for a lot of games, like they kind of take a backseat approach to that, like, oh, we'll figure it out. Or it's like the players, they, they just want to bang, right? And they don't really think about like the emotional portion of that, that a lot of people are really looking for. Because it's like humans are just emotional people, even if they're not looking for romance specifically, people just want human connection. And that's like the core of what people should be thinking about when they make these kind of games. I think one thing that AAA games can certainly take apart or, or look into is seeing, acknowledging the way that fans build up relationships with characters in their game, even when the characters haven't said anything. Um, so whether that's in Skyrim, you have a companion who has always been there with you and man, been through just some weird, crazy fights or help, you know, like you put a bucket on someone's head and they, like accidentally gave away that you were sneaking around. I don't know, but it, there's all these like sort of random things that occur that then people assign value to and, and acknowledge this, the, like your, your companions become extremely important. And it would be great if when you did have discussions with your companions in those games, that I think the writers kind of acknowledge that that people build bigger relationships than what's even on, than what's on the page. Um, and, and I think I, I think it's cool to see that in a lot of smaller indie um, visual novels because we can see how fans have interacted with things and, and kind of taken relationships to their own level of, of deciding like stuff that, that just even goes out of the bounds of the story. Um, and I hope that we see AAA studios kind of opening up in, in ways that allow for more of that to happen and acknowledging maybe that their characters can behave in a little more friendly and emotionally deep ways. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll jump into um, this question. Uh, Ali had a question. I think this is probably going to be more relevant for um, Quatemo and, um, uh, and Alexei. But um, so after finishing a, a game of your own, um, what what do you do essentially to promote your work as an indie designer? I mean, this is, it, it's relevant for everyone, obviously, because we're always going to be uh, promoting our work out there. But, you know, uh, after you finish a game, what do you, what do you do? 
so you know the kfc thing is very atypical because it has this huge intellectual property attached to it and um succeeded beyond anyone's expectations that being said i've worked on multiple other indie um, projects and one of them you know i submitted to the indie mega booth which is a kind of professional organization dedicated to exposing small games and that was accepted um so i went to to pax and stood at a booth for a few days and and that was a vr experience and i actually took that to many different shows all over the world for like a year um you know it was it was a lot um and you know, I've also participated in Indicade, um, which is here in Los Angeles. I see Tiffany fist pumping for both those. Um, there's just like these really great organizations of people. I know Tyler mentioned Glitch LA, you know, that again, these are kind of local LA examples. Um, but a lot of cities have professional organizations where they want you to join and participate. Um, and it's, it's a great way to not only learn and make connections, but also promote your work. Um, and participate in online communities, you know, for, for, for KFC, you know, they paid a few influencers like the Game Grumps to make YouTube videos when the game released, they didn't really know how Twitch worked and the power of that particular community. Um, but building the game, that was something that I really kept in mind is the, the performance aspect of playing a visual novel with your friends. Um, and so building something that was compelling for a group watch that had a lot of characters that were unique that people could jump in and voice like it's that's a really great tool for um for promoting yourself make streamer food you know streamers gotta eat and they gotta make content and they gotta do something on their stream and if it's your game that's a great promotional tool um so maybe that's just hanging out on on twitch making sure you you make friends um join discords be a part of a community. You can't expect people to just promote you because you ask politely. Um, you gotta give um, and you have to participate in a community or else um, you're just an interloper um, trying to take advantage and, and nobody wants to be that um, or be felt like that. But I think that goes back to what Tyler was saying earlier about this feeling that we're there. A lot of us are kind of like loners doing our own thing and, and feeling like we have our team and, and, and our life ends there um you know maybe i hope the past year has opened up people to understanding just you know how how much you can do in terms of socializing online but um it's a great place to 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 promote yourself is among your friends right like you just you got to make the friends first yeah i like definitely agree um i'm still working on lovecraft but uh, i also preface all of what i'm about to say with i'm deeply introverted um i, I love being alone but making friends is been like the number one reason that I, I uh, yeah, that, that, I, that anything happens. Um, just meet people, be friendly, um, reach out to them every now and again, get coffee, and don't just make connections to be making connections, like, because um, that'll definitely make you feel like a vulture, but if you genuinely enjoy, like, being, being around someone, you enjoy their work, like, be genuine. I think that's, like, the number one way that people actually connect with you and want to help you out. Awesome. Um, so I guess for the final question uh, for the evening, uh, which is kind of hilarious, uh, Natalia asked this question, which was actually the same question that I originally prepared to ask the panel anyway to close. Uh, and that is, what are some formal aspects uh, of design of the dating sim genre that you would like to see explored further? And, and really kind of in, in even a grander topic there, you know, having worked in the dating sim genre now uh, for, for years, what do you hope that the industry could do more of? I, I think it's just in a really technical answer to that. Um, the ability to craft responses that that break you away from like a binary choice system of like, you know, you've hit a fork in the road in the script. Um, you're going to head left or right. And, you know, there's ways to craft complicated choices that have, um, that have lasting effects and, and have multiple variables attached to them, but it's still tough. It's a tough thing to do. And, and it's tough enough that not a lot of people do it. And when I see, you know, like Netflix adopting choose your own adventure storytelling, and, and it's back to like, oh, it's a fork in the road, you go left or you go right. And like, you'll get the story you get. 
um, versus more complicated games like Disco Elysium, which is, you know, a very narrative heavy game, not a kind of Twitch um, as in reflex oriented game where um, it's, it's layering on choices on top of choices on top of choices. And it's threading these interesting pathways that only happen when you are sort of um, interacting in certain ways that still relies a lot on your sort of initial character creation and how you level your character up. You know, it, it'd be interesting to talk back basically um, within a story. And that's a tougher thing to do to compose a response in, in the middle of a game that takes you someplace. But I'm looking forward to more and more people tackling that and coming up with really cool interactive experiences. I would like to see, I think, more organic, um, like relationship building instead of just like press X to flirt, which you see in like a lot of games, um, like especially in situations where it would otherwise be pretty inappropriate. Um, so I'm wondering if there's like an interesting way to gamify your responses, like to the love interest that you're pursuing um, to first like build that friendship and then like proceed from there. Because like, I understand why the flirt option is there from the get go. It's like to relate to the audience that like this is a love interest that you can pursue. Um, but it just doesn't feel like super organic in a lot of ways. And so I would like to see a world in which we like pursue that and make that a little bit more nuanced. Um, I'm not really sure what that would look like, but it'd be cool. I I think I'd really like to see a dating sim that gets into the nitty gritty of that first that first kiss. Um, so like, because I I think everything leading up to that in, in real life is like such a, a question of like, do I just go for it? Well, oh, we made eye contact for like an extra three seconds. Does that, oh, did, did they move their head a little bit forward? Um, there's like so many things that are going on that you have to process and try and be like, oh, oh okay, oh, it's happening, what's going on? Um, and I think, I, I think I'd really like to see someone attempt to, to explore that occasion in, in a game format. I don't know what that looks like. Uh, also, I'd really like to see everyone's wearing Apple Watches and Fitbits. Um, so I think we have a pretty standardized way of measuring people's pulses. And I, th I think it'd be really nice to start having a heart rate meter to determine the choices that your character's allowed to say or how likely they are to correctly say them. Um, so maybe they get a little tongue-tied if, if your heart's really racing. Uh, those ideas are free. Me. If you well, want to make them, go for it. Wasn't there a, a Wii vitality sensor at one point that was revealed <laughs> at a E3? Like, I think so. I think their plan was to use it for a zombie game, but um what if they used it for a kissing game <laughs> i feel like i would never actually end up at the kiss like my character would just like have a panic attack <laughs> like, just like die of, die of shame <laughs> a lot of muscle exactly. relaxer black market tied into <laughs> to visual novel yeah um but i, I would just want to see like just more queerness i want to see more um diversity of like gender and sexuality um it's funny someone brought up dragon age like i i loved that you could romance anyone and everyone was on the table no matter like what gender you picked um it definitely like you could say it lacks nuance but it definitely um as like a queer person I was just like cool everyone's pan awesome uh so stuff like that is, is especially attractive to me awesome and just uh before I hand it back to the lovely folks at IGDA LA um would you guys like to quickly plug yourselves, uh, tell people where they can find you, what's the most recent thing you're working on and what should, uh, you know, what Discord channels they should go drop in. Uh, I guess I'll uh, well, go ahead, uh, Alexei. Yeah, uh, mostly I'm on Twitter at hey Alexei. Um, so H-U-I and then, and then my first name. Um, you'll see me tagged in some tweets about this event. Um, that's, that tends to be where I, I hang out online the most. Um, I work on NDA stuff. I don't have anything I can talk about. I'm making more video game trailers. I'm making more weird branded games. Um, hopefully all things that uh, the audiences appreciate when they're shoved upon them via some sort of ad buy uh, in the future. Um, and then just, yeah, if anybody else wants to, to follow up um, on anything, you can always reach out to me on, on Twitter. It's just the easiest way to get at me. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Guatemala? 
Uh, yeah, you can follow um, Lovecraft at Lovecraft BB on Twitter. Um, I'm also on Twitter at um, Altermundos and uh, also on uh, Instagram under that same name. Um, yeah, uh, we'll have some announcements soon. So, cool. Kelsey? Sure. All right. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at KD Lunas. It's right there. Um, let's see. I'm also working on Slow Burn, which is coming out next month on Choices. Um, I'm also working on a top-down shooter called Death Carnival, which is very divorced from this <laughs> panel here, uh, which is also exciting, coming out this year, and an NDA project. So follow me for Sebulba shit posts. You'll love it. Thank you. Awesome. And then uh, Tyler? Uh, yeah, hi. I'm Tyler. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Tyler J. Hutchison. It's on the thing right here. Uh, or Instagram at awful Tyler. It uh, cool, t cool. Tyler was already taken, so I just um, I, I I felt like there's a whole lot of me on that thing. So it's just an awful, awful lot of Tyler. It's awful, Tyler. Um, I'm currently working on Solar Ash, coming up for PlayStation Five sometime this year. Uh, I'm not gonna say when because I don't know what dates have been announced or not announced. So I'm just gonna be like, it's coming out this year, um, and yeah. Uh, I feel like I had one last thing I wanted to say, but I, I don't remember. Oh, yeah, d just be prepared for lots of drawings of like video game characters kissing each other if you follow my Instagram. Uh, gets pretty steamy. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I'll go ahead and hand it back to the lovely folks at IGDA. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Z. Um, everyone do a round of applause for our wonderful panel, our moderator, everyone who was here on both Twitch and on um, uh, Zoom. So we're going to cut the feed to uh, Twitch and, you know, we'll be able to have this um, video packaged on YouTube. Follow us on all things IGDA LA. Uh, and just thank you once again to all of our amazing panelists. Um, uh, I remember Zusa said that there's a romance SIG uh, for IGDA. So hit her up if you want to have more to do with that. I'm sure you can find the base of the community there. Oh, and apparently there's a Discord. Oh my gosh, so many things. Um, yeah, and if you want a key from Alexi, it, lo uh, it looks like they put uh, instructions in the Zoom chat. So Miranda if, and Drew, if we can keep the Zoom open for a little bit so that Alexi can copy yeah, paste hit me up. thousands of keys to people or possibly sure. on Twitter. Sure. Uh, yeah, if you find Alexi me, if you're watching this and you want to check out Camp W, you can get at me and I'll hook you up with a key, save you the, the four bucks or whatever. Aw, you're amazing. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Gong hei fat choi to everyone who's celebrating Lunar New Year. Happy Valentine's Day to everyone. As, uh, Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Go eat discount chocolate. Um, Miranda, what have I forgotten? I'm sure I've forgotten something incredibly important. Um, if anyone, you know, if you have any ideas for a future event for IGALA, please feel free to message us. We're always looking for new voices to highlight, um, new genres to talk about. Uh, and just in general, we just want to highlight the wonderful game devs in our community. Yes, and uh, Drew just dropped in the chat, la at igda.org is where you can email us officially, or you can follow us on Twitter, Twitch, uh, social media platform of your preference, IGDA LA. Um, and please feel free to uh, at us on Twitter and like message us on Twitter or whatever with ideas, or if you're like, you know what, I want a panel full of games involving Fitbits, something like that, let us know. We'll do our best to execute on it. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming, guys. I hope you learned a little bit of the art of love before, like during love season. <laughs> <laughs>